Friends in Recovery, the Addiction Recovery Podcast, is brought to you by the Friends in Recovery Community, a thriving network of individuals who are fighting back against the stigma of addiction. Join our hosts as they speak up about the real issues of addiction, treatment, and recovery. Friends in Recovery, the Addiction Recovery Podcast, is available on Facebook, Podbean, iTunes, and YouTube 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, here are your friends in recovery. Welcome, everybody, to the Friends in Recovery podcast with Jersey Ed. I'm your host, Jersey Ed, guys. It's kind of a no-brainer, I guess, <laughs> along with my two co-hosts. Nope, not two co-hosts, because we do have Buckeye Bambi, but we also have Blowing Us Off Beth. No Beth today. Thanks, Beth, for blowing us off. We appreciate it. And uh, <laughs> But... Uh, but our our topic this week, our show this week, actually, is Amy Jack. She's an interventionist and a person in long term recovery, and she's going to speak a little bit about um interventions and big book and you name it. We're all going to talk about everything. So I told her we have twenty six hours to do this show, and if she can get it all in with that, she's okay. So stay tuned. Um, today is Founders Day, guys. Um, happy birthday to AA. When we're recording this show, when it comes out, it'll be a couple of days later, but 88 years old. Happy birthday. And thank God for Bill and Bob and uh, what they have done for us. Because um, I wouldn't be here today if if they haven't, uh, if AA wasn't involved, it wasn't invented or whatever, you know, founded. Is that it? Founded? Invented? Um, <laughs> don't forget, it's, it is Big Book a month here on Friends Recovery Podcast. So if you have any questions about the big book, our big book expert, Blow Us Off Beth, is not here today. So <laughs> we'll just have to fake it. We'll have to make believe we know what's going on. So um, anyway, so that's kind of what's happening today on the podcast. An intern needed, if anybody would like to be our intern. Um, Bob, since you're not working the weekends, you may want to apply for that job. I mean, working, you're uh, not running the weekends now. Uh, you may want to apply for that job. Um, and stay tuned for some amazing recovery. It doesn't sound like it, but it'll get better, guys. I promise it'll get much better as we go. It along. always does. Yeah, once Amy starts talking, it'll it'll just get it way better. Works right up. It's a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not because you cannot top this easily, Amy. <laughs> just say the ABCs and it tops what we're doing right now. So <laughs> um, so to get a hold of us, um, uh, if you want to give ask, find out why. Uh, Beth isn't here blowing us off. Beth isn't here. You can call 800-989-6504. That's a non-emergency line only. Uh, questions uh, about treatment, about AA, whatever it is, you can call us there. Or if you want to send us an email, help at friendsandrecoverypodcast.com and go to our website, friendsandrecoverycommunity.org. Um, and then you can email us directly where you'll see our our names underneath our picture there. And uh, you can email us directly. Um, Bambi, myself, and Beth. I don't know if Beth's email is going to be up there, but we'll see what Carl does with it. And look in, look for us on all our social media, Friends in Recovery, um, communities. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. And, and that the push notification that, bell's on. That little notification bell, boom, there it is. Hopefully Carl put it right there. And give us a 20 star review, right? 20 stars. Is that what we're looking for? Give us 20 purple hearts. 20. No, no purple hearts. Comments help engagement. So Speaking, we need you all to leave that's purple right. hearts. That's right. Speaking of purple hearts, it's uh, Bambi's purple hearts, as you can see. Um, Beth is black hearts. You can't see that because she's not here today. Um, our guest, Amy, is going to have red hearts. And um, Jersey Ed, of course, blue hearts. So please, in those comments below, um, leave those hearts. Bambi always gets purple uh, purple hearts all the time, um, Amy. So can you pass the show along to your friends and make sure that they give everybody else hearts except for Bambi, please? <laughs> <laughs> That's because I send it to all my friends. I like, know you do. Wow. I know. Bambi, I work beg. it, man. Purple you work hearts, it. Please. She yeah, must have 10,000 purple hearts right now. So, um, <laughs> but it's a little something that we can engage the audience with and, and all our hearts are up there. So it's fun. It's fun. Uh, let's see. I'd like to thank all of our donors that make this show, po made this show possible. And don't forget, Friends and Recovery Podcast is now part of the Fire Network. For more information on both of those, go to friendsandrecoverycommunity.org. Guys, also real quick, I just want to ask... Um, 
for a favor. If you guys have it in your heart or if you have it in your pocket, if you don't, that's okay too. Um, it's, you know, it's been a year that we've been doing this on our own and um, we are looking for donations to help this podcast run and help our friends and recovery communities and meetings run. So um, if you go to our website, um, I think they can go to the website, right? And they'll, they'll be directed to where to go f- to make the donations. Yeah, soon. And see below too with all yeah, the links. See below. I have it listed in the notes. So yeah, them. please, please. So if you have it, we appreciate it. If not, that's okay too. Keep coming. And, um, you know, we, we love what we do here at Friends in Recovery. So that's how we stay alive is through donations. So don't, uh, if you have a chance to do that, we appreciate it. And don't forget, we have twice daily and sometimes three times AA meetings on Zoom. Uh, you can find them again on friendsandrecoverycommunity.org. Um, and that website should be up and running. It's up and running, but everything will be right. on it soon. So right. we're working on meetings it. Meetings are on there now. So could be, could be. Anyways, they and are. there's all specialty meetings on there and all kinds of stuff. So ladies, do you know what time it is? Question, Question of the week. Question, Question of the week. Question of the week. <laughs> there'll be little explosions it's very- there you go there's all the explosions and uh carl thank you for that so guys the question of the week is what does trudge the road of happy destiny mean to you and what a pretty good uh, question for founders day today yeah. too, right i mean um you know if, if we didn't have founders day and 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 we didn't have aa there would be no road to happy destiny for me anyways and trudging would not be trudging. It would be, you know, leaving an arm here and, you know, a toe here, or, you know, all that. It'd be, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be tough for me. So, so I'm going to pose that question to our folks in on Facebook Live, also in the comments below. Let us know what that means to you guys. And then we're going to bring it over to our, our, uh, our guest, Amy Jack. Um, if she will, if she chooses to answer it, it's okay if you don't. But what's your, what's your thoughts on that? I think, I mean, to me personally, I think it means persevere, like mm-hmm. as, as simple, as simple as I can get it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, for, for me, life is, life is going to happen. Um, and, you know, trudging, keep and keep going one step at a time. Um, and, and I love the simplicity of that, of that sentence, you know, and going back to, Today's Founders Day. Mm. Today's AA's birthday. A couple yeah. of guys that got together 88 years ago. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. That is. You know, and, and you know, I think of Dr. Bob's farewell speech, you know, and he's like, let's not louse this thing up. Let's keep it simple, you know, and, and the human in me and, you know, tries to get in there and complicate it, mm. you know, when, when I can just keep it simple. Um, just keep taking one step at a time. You know, my, my day is a lot more balanced. So mm. that's what it means to me. Keeping it simple. Very good. I love that. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the simpleness and persevere, just push through it all, whatever it is. Um, the other thing too, I want to, I want to really say is rule 62, right? Um, keep, you know, let's, let's not complicate shit. Let's, let's, you know, keep it simple. Let's, uh, you know, Don't just, just enjoy life. Seriously. Don't take yourself yeah. too seriously. That's what it's about. You know, I mean, all these rules that they wanted and they came back with rule 62 and that's the only rule that stuck. And it's true. It's, you know, we can't complicate our lives, you know, and, and we can't complicate this program because it is, I am a complicated person. So I need something that's going to say, this is how you do it when you do it, where you do it. And this is the result. And that's what AA gives me. So um, great, great answer. Great answer. Uh, Bambi, you have to follow that now with Amy. I know, just right? <laughs> All right. So trudge to me, um, like, it. you know, when your parents used to say, oh, we walked uphill through the snow for five <laughs> miles to get to the school, you know, and we had to go every day. So that kind of thing. Trudge is like with a heavy foot or like a not necessarily like a burdening, but I mean, you have to, it, there's going to be difficulties. So if you want to get to the promises, you've got to go through all the difficulties and the struggles that are going to come along between the promises coming true as you work the steps. So that's what it kind of means to me is that, you know, it's not going to all be easy. You know, you're going to have to trudge, you know, walk that, pick up those feet when they're heavy and keep going. So, mm. so not easy, but 
not easy, doable, but the but promises doable. are going to come true. And that's right. the happy destiny that, you know, is promised to us in the book if we work these steps. That's it. That's it. You know, and, and that is so true. And here's the definition of trudge, to, to walk or march steadily and usually laboriously. Okay. And that's what life's about. I mean, you know, think about it, you know, like when we're in, when we're in change or things are happening, we have to push through that stuff because on the other side of change or whatever it is, is going to become growth. And that's where we get to the happy destiny. And I don't, to me, trudging isn't just one time you get an AA and you have to trudge through all the shit. And then you're, you, you arrived, you know, you're at the top of AA's uh, class or you, you, you know, you made their, uh, whatever Dean's list. That's not what it is. You know, there's the honor trudging. roll. You're on the honor. honor roll. Yeah, exactly. I would never make the honor roll anywhere. So <laughs> not even here on this show, I wouldn't even vote my for myself for the honor roll on this show. But um, to me, it means that, you know, I have to take each part of my life and knowing I'm, I'm going to trudge through some things, but there's going to be an outcome. There's going to be something good that's going to happen. If I keep staying persistent, just like you said, um, Amy, and and just push through it. And and it's not easy. I Like Bambi said, I know it's not easy, but as long as I keep going through it, as long as I work the steps, talk to my sponsor, push through whatever it is, talk about things, don't drink, go to meetings, all that simple stuff, I'm going to be okay. Because trudging in this program, I don't think... I, I shouldn't say that. Well, whatever. I don't think it's that hard because we have all the tools to trudge through all this stuff and get there rather easily. I think it's me that complicates it, that, you know, goes way deep in the mud where I shouldn't be going, where I should be coming off the other path and maybe trudging through a little bit of dirt instead of all that mud. I like to veer off into the mud and and, you know, throw mud mud at people. That's just who I am. So it makes my life a little bit harder. But then I veer back onto the path and, you know, it is still trudging, but it gets much easier as I get closer and closer to whatever that is. So I like that you said that because, you know, it's my belief that, yeah, early recovery is tough. And some mm. days even now, almost a dozen year, years later can be tough. Mm. Um, but it's it's not like every day I'm waking up just trying to get through the day without a drink, you know, yeah. that's, that's the beauty of the program. And, you know, like you said, working the steps and just keeping it simple. Mm -hmm. And just for me, that meant following directions and even today following directions, but that was the hardest thing for me in early recovery, you know, was to just follow directions. <laughs> <laughs> follow direction. <laughs> that's tough. Things. Yeah. You know, you be yeah, involved. exactly. Well, I was I was listening to hey, guys. I'm going to bring Amy in it was, since we're bringing we're doing this already. Uh, Amy uh, Jack, she's an interventionist. She is from South Georgia. We'll find out a little bit more of what's going on with her, and and she's uh, she she kind of she's in long term recovery, as you guys can tell. Um, and welcome to the show, Amy. How are you? Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. You're welcome. I am You're welcome. well. Good. Yeah. good and don't good, forget good. our sober shout outs. Oh, our sober shout outs. That's right. Did we forget sober one. shout outs? Yeah. Oh my you, God. You how did I, how did I skip? So see, I need an intern guys. I need an intern. I need somebody. And you know what? Hold on. I'm going to stop right there. Okay. Cause I got zero, zero, zero emails with interns and in bikinis. Zero. I'm very, I'm very Me disappointed. Too. I didn't get any you know, <laughs> male interns in bikini either. <laughs> so anyways, let's get those interns going. And here is our sober shout out. So let's go with Amy first, and then we'll reintroduce you, Amy. Well, we won't introduce you, but we'll we'll just bring you back in. So any sober shout outs today? I mean, other than the birth of AA, mm -hmm. I, I want to give a sober shout out to my fiance's son, um, who is, you know, essentially going to be my stepson. Uh -oh. um, he is 18 and he's been in treatment now for about 40 days. Oh, so congratulations. All right. Out of them. All right. Yeah. Congratulations to stepson. All right. <laughs> 40 days. That's great. Yeah. Um, Bambi, what do you have? I top that it. one. There you go. It. Top it. You do you have to top it? I'm gonna have you're gonna have to try to top Amy every time we go. All right. I know. I, know. I don't like that. Um, <laughs> I want to go first. Um, no, okay, so no. <laughs> my first sober shout out is to one of my sponsees who is um um getting some help for her mental health um issues and getting Yay. back on track and yes. i want to shout out to her and um cindy 
And also I have a sober shout out for um, sobriety, our cursing Christian who was on here not long yes. ago, Joe O. Joe um, O. Who's a guest and he has 10 years. Congratulations, Joe O, the curse, oh, cursing yeah. Christian. And uh, Cindy, keep up the good work. We love you, girl. So, um, and let's see. I have uh, I have uh, two shout outs, two sober shout outs. One A's birthday, of course. I mean, that's kind of a given. And, you know, my standard shout out is and, and he's just on there now as he pops up. He probably is just waiting. To hear me. Yeah. Um, I would like to just to thank sober pod and everything that they do on the left coast. We're on the right coast. Well, sort of Bambi's in the middle. But uh, <laughs> but I like to thank Carl for everything he does for us. And I also want to. Uh, talk to you guys about Carl's book that baby's going to read from today. It's called 30, 366 fucking days sober. It's available on Amazon. The um, link will be in the notes. The link will be in the notes. Please buy that up. Um, I think um, uh, Carl has a mortgage payment coming up soon. So um, the 30 cents he makes on each book uh, will help him pay his mortgage. No, I'm kidding. Um, just, when yeah, just you buy it, go in and give him a great review. That's give right. him a five-star review. You know, I, I've been reading this book like every day since I got it about a month or so now. And every day it's, I mean, he's like a real writer. Like he really, like he, I think he, he thinks That's he's a real writer. Yeah. I know. I know. So anyways, thank you, Carl, for that. And Bambi's going to read today's um, 366 fucking days sober. All right. For Founders Day, June 10th, which is when this is being recorded, you don't have to do everything right now. Slow down, but not too slow. It would be best if you did something daily to achieve your goals. The question is, how do you eat an elephant? The answer is one bite at a time. As addicts and alcoholics, we have a tendency toward instant gratification. We get an idea about playing guitar or returning to school, and we want it all right now. We want to be able to play guitar like a pro or get our diploma after the first day back to school. Instant fucking gratification. When this doesn't happen, we get discouraged and give up. Thinking we have tried, we never try again. Everything takes time. You have to start somewhere. You won't be a pro at whatever it is today, but you can work towards setting smaller goals today to achieve what you want later. And the reflection, are you setting realistic, achievable goals? The daily challenge is to write down one thing you want to do in the next year. Now that steps, what steps do you need to take to get there? Break the big goal down into smaller, manageable goals. Mm. That's pretty darn good. He's good. I know. I think he had AI writ write that because it, like oh one day God. he said he's writing a book and the next day it's written. Come on. That's a little weird, isn't it, guys? <laughs> no, that is that is pretty good. And, uh, you know, my, my goal, I want to be like Carl in a year. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. So that's the reading for today, guys. And if you want to reflect on it, please in um, Facebook, let us know, comment or send us an email. So here it is. We're back to introducing our guest, Amy Jack. Again, here she is. <laughs> Interventionist, uh, long term recovery, uh, has a stepson and all kinds of good stuff in recovery <laughs> now. Everything's going good. So, Amy, so tell us a little bit about you for the second time almost. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, again, glad to be here with you guys. Um, I, yeah, I'm an interventionist. I didn't start out in the field that way. I started out, um, about nine years ago working at a treatment center. Um, and it was a long-term, uh, re recovery residence for women, really 12 step immersion based, highly, you know, 12 step oriented. And, um, about a year ago, uh, I decided I wanted to take a new path and mm -hmm. I'm so glad I did. You know, I, I love working with families. One of the things that I really, you know, really wanted to focus on when I was at that treatment center was the families mm -hmm. because I, I see recovery as a twofold process. You know, there's that for the individual and then there's that for the families. And a lot of the times the families just get forgotten about. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, and families are scared to death, right? Um, so I, uh, I embarked on a new journey and I, I love it. I, you know, love being able to step in and just, I mean, every family I think needs direction, you know, when, when they've been completely, you know, consumed with addiction, mm -hmm. 
and the chaos of that and living with that. And, um, and so families just don't know what to do. Um, and that, and that is, that is so true, Amy. I, I want to, um, I, I, I like how you said families are, are forgotten, for, get f- forgotten about. What are some of the, um, like, uh, not signs, but what, like, how do you help the families? How, how do they know? How do you make them know that they are forget forgotten about um, and that they are important and they do play a role in this disease? I mean, that's the problem with the families because sometimes they, they want to put themselves at, hey, listen, it's not, not my problem. Um, you know, he f- stole the money. He stole the car. He got high. He overdosed. She did this. They did that. Whatever. Not me. Not me. The family. But you know, I, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't see when he. I didn't say anything when he stole the car. I didn't say anything when he took the money. I didn't say anything when he overdosed. He should be in treatment. So is that a problem also towards the addict? Yeah. Um. <laughs> and you know, families, they're all different, right? And some of them are very much aware, right? Like okay, I I know that I've been doing this, this, and this, but I'm terrified Mm -hmm. to try something different because, you know, for whatever reason, they're going to die or I'm going to push them even further away. There's there's a lot of Mm -hmm. fear there that keeps families stuck. And that ambivalence is dangerous. Mm -hmm. Um, So really just educating the family. Um, And, you know, there's a lot of prep work that goes in before an intervention. And that's where a lot of that education comes in and a lot of where, you know, they're able to, with my help, kind of identify what boundaries and changes they can make Mm -hmm. um, to move into the solution, right? That we're going to move out of the problem. And that starts immediately. It starts from that first phone call. You know, Um, alcoholics get really good at manipulating our families. I mean, I used to threaten my husband all the time. If you want me, you weren't going to make me go to treatment. I'm divorcing your ass. Mm. You know, um, I mean, you get really good at it. And families do feel like they're they're held hostage by the alcoholic. Yeah, that's a great word. And I, I actually use that, you know, because that's the truth. And when families are held hostage, they're stuck you know, and they don't think they can do anything different. So families, the way that I see it, it's like they need permission to Mm -hmm. be able to, you know, have these and set these just appropriate, healthy, normal boundaries, right? That's what they are, Mm -hmm. where, you know, they protect them. And um, so, yeah, I, I love that, Bambi, you know, hostage. We, when, when the addiction is running the family, they are held hostage. So that's, that's what I help move the family out of. So, and, so, yeah. so you're saying held it, holding them hostage, um, you know, the addict holding the family hostage. And then, then you said something interesting. They, they get permission not to be an enabling. So what, what, you know, what, who gives them permission? Do they need permission? And, and why would we give them permission when it's their own life and they need to do what they need to do? Can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, I think because what addiction does to a family, it uses their love against them. Mm. Right. And families, it doesn't feel, it almost doesn't feel natural to, you know, for a family to say like, you know, I love you. I have this opportunity here for you, but if you choose not to take it, then I'm going to have to step back, Mm -hmm. you know, and I'm going to allow you to have the experience that you need to have. I'm not going to rob you of that, but, um, this is just too painful for me to be a part of anymore and to watch. Mm -hmm. So families, because it feels so unnatural and they've been in this cycle for so long, um, it's like they need to hear from a professional, from somebody. And that's where I come in and I say, this is, this is normal. You know, it's not like I use the word, you have permission to do this, but in a sense, that's what I'm doing. And I'm telling them that this is okay. This is healthy. How, how quickly does it take, a family to, when you say, you know, this is what we're going to do and exactly what you explained, do, do they grasp on that instantly or do they give you pushback because, oh no, you know, and here's the other question that, that I'm going to throw at you. I can't kick him out of the house because he'll die out there. How many times did you hear that? Right. Um, yeah. So all those two questions kind of go hand in hand and, and how do you handle that question? And also, you know, when does the family grasp that? Or do they or don't they sometimes? They do. Um, it's a process for them, right? I mean, their their big change is mm-hmm. it's a process, yeah. right? Yeah. And so 
And, you know, I, I'm not there to, to tell the family, this is what you need to do. They're going to come up with their own boundaries, um, you know, and I'm going to help support that. Right. Um, but it's it's a process. Mm -hmm. So what about that question where, you know, I can't kick him out of the house or he's going to die out there? Um, there's a so, thousand different ways to answer that question, actually. <laughs> yeah. um, more often than not. So I, I've, I've never had a family who has said, you know, hey, you're, you can't live here anymore under our roof and continue to use and and drink um, where their loved one died out there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Of Typically course. they're dying in their home in their bedroom. Yeah. It's exactly what happens. And, yeah. but the families think that, that we can, that they can keep them safe because yeah. that's what their, I think that's what their whole MO or that their, their, their kind of existence is in that family dynamics is let's keep them safe. Let's give him money so he can use, let's, you know, watch him where he's going. Let's drive him to where he needs to go. Let's, you know, and, but that's, that's part of killing the, the, the loved one, you know, I mean, just all you that know, codependency yeah, stuff, you know, yeah. I mean, you become very codependent and, um, and again, the alcoholic and addict knows how to manipulate and get what they want. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, it's the illusion of control, right? Mm. And when we feel like we have some control, you know, there's, we, we feel like we are able to do something right. Um, but it's, it's. We really don't. It's it's the illusion. Mm. The illusion of control, holding you hostage, um, moving into this the um the solutions, unnatural, like all these all these words are like for us because we're in this and, and Bambi, you know, is around this all the time. But for a family, those words are scary, unnatural. Um, you know, educating the family. I don't need education. I know exactly what my son or daughter or loved one does. You don't have to fucking tell me shit. Like, who the fuck are you? You don't even know me. I hired you. Who the hell are you? Right. I mean, how many times do you hear that? Right. That's crazy. You know? Well, I haven't heard that yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just did. <laughs> but, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of families out there and I'm sure I've worked with some that are like, yeah. wait, you yeah. know, um, and, you know, I what what I do. So I yes, there's a lot of prep work that goes in before mm -hmm. we do the intervention. Right. But after that. You know, if if we get a yes that day on intervention day, great. I'm taking them to detox, right? Um, if if we don't get a yes, then you know the families are going to follow through with the boundaries that mm -hmm. they set, and uh, and they're going to allow their loved one to have the experience out there that they need, right? We're mm -hmm. not going to rob them of that. That's going to help motivate them to get into treatment. Um, but you know. I think I, I lost my train of thought with that. That's one. okay. <laughs> <laughs> what about after treatment, Amy? What? About oh, yeah. Okay. Treatment? So that's it. Thank you, Bambi. Yeah. Thank you. So, Bambi's the whole show. Bambi does yeah, everything around here. Yeah. <laughs> so once their loved ones in treatment, I am still meeting with the families once a week on Zoom, and I'm I'm still giving them support, encouraging them to seek their own wellness. Right. This is important because. For so long, they've been consumed with the addict in their life, the alcoholic mm -hmm. in their life. So they're going to seek their own journey of wellness, whether that be an Al-Anon, which I fully support, um, getting, you know, begin to see their own therapist, take part in the family program that the treatment center has, mm -hmm. um, and continue to work with that family to make sure that there's a parallel journey of recovery going, mm -hmm. through, right? Their loved one and them. Yeah. Um, so after treatment, are you speaking about the individual or the family? The family. I mean, family. just how they, you know, how do you, well, I wanted to know how you stay connected with them and how do you encourage them mm -hmm. that to maintain the boundaries after the person is out of treatment and that kind of thing, because it's pretty easy when they're away for 30 days, but what about when they come home? Yeah. So, you know, ideally, and, and I'm there with the family through treatment completion, you know, so if it takes 30 days or a year, I'm going to be there with them through it all. Um, ideally, the hope is, and, and what I, you know, work with the family on doing is, again, beginning their own journey of recovery and something that is going to last once their loved one is out of treatment. And whether it be that their loved one is coming back home, or maybe they're going to a sober living, um, you know, where they can get a full continuum of care here 
and, you know, begin to step out on their own and become financially independent. I mean, every family wants that, you know, Mm -hmm. they want, they just want their loved one to be okay and to be financially independent and stable and sober. And, you know, there's, 28,000 programs in the United Mm -hmm. States, right? Mm -hmm. So there's the opportunity for that to happen where maybe they don't need to necessarily go right back. Um, Maybe they can, you know, continue on and at a sober living and, and get the the skills, just the daily living skills Mm -hmm. that they need to be able to stand on their own. I want to bring that back to maintaining the, um, the boundaries uh, when, when they get home. Um, that also goes for the family side of things too, because when, you know, if the family doesn't get help or they get half-ass help, or if they're not really into it, yeah, that's his problem, not mine, or that's her problem, not mine. When they come back without them knowing it, they're going to sabotage their loved ones. How many times have you seen that where the family, cause that, you know, that, that cog in the wheel has to fit. And then when it doesn't fit, you got you got to fix it. Either you got to fix it to make it better or to make it the way it used to be. So it goes again, because that loved one can't live in the house the way he or she, when they come back from treatment and that's either a relapse or that forces them out of house to go to sober living or whatever the case may be. So what's your thoughts on that? So I had um, a mom that had hired me for an intervention and, you know, I was talking about the full continuum of care because her daughter at that point had been into treatment five times before. Right. And so, um, I said, I see a pattern developing here and that's, she goes for 30 days and she comes back home. Right. So we need to change that up. Mom's open to it. And, you know, she said, well, you know, but when does the buck stop? Right. When does it stop? No, you know, I said, honestly, uh, it stops when you change. Right. I'm going to help you with that. Um, So as simple as it is, you know, the, the families would unknowingly for a lot of them, you know, because they just don't know what to do. Um, Make, and I don't want to say make, but can, you know, without any changes, nothing changes, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Nothing changes, nothing changes. changes. And you're not talking about major changes, like, uh, you know, like, whatever, but you're talking about small, little gradual changes that the family can make while the loved one is in treatment. And then they can prepare for all that when he or she gets out. And either they live with them or even if they're not living with them, because they still can manipulate from a sober living from, you know, they're wherever they're at, you know, it's still manipulation. And that family has to stand strong no matter where that um, addict or alcohol or that, that client is. Right. Yeah. And it's it's one thing to continue. You know, they say, let's say their loved ones in sober living and they're trying to get out of there, you know, or manipulate. It's one thing to have me to be able to bounce that off of, which the families have. Right. Um, and it's another also to add in your support group with Alan, you know, mm-hmm. with other family members who have been there or maybe are there themselves already. Um, so really having families need a tool belt as well. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, they they they're in the process of, of learning a lot. And a lot of them, Ed, I mean, you're right. They think and I'll be honest with you, my, my family was the same way. When I got sober, you know, they were like, nothing's wrong with us. You know, why do you want us to come to these family workshops, you know, and dive in? And so um, I get it, you know? Yeah. I remember when, I remember when I got into recovery, my grandmother used to, and I, I'm, I'm okay with, obviously I'm on a podcast. I'm okay with my recovery being wherever, my grandmother would always say, oh, yeah, this is my grandson. He's the only person that had a problem with addiction in our family or, you know, alcoholism or drug, whatever. And meanwhile, you know, everybody else in the family, it's just the family just doesn't want to deal with it. You know what I mean? And and that's OK. Um, for me, it was OK because it's it's my recovery and I have to run with it. No, I, I can't change the family and me as an addict or an alcoholic. Um, I have to understand that only person I can change is me. And if they don't want to change unfortunately I might have to cut you out of my life. And I learned that early in recovery because some of the family members don't want to change. I mean, you've probably seen it, Amy, where, where the family members don't want to change. They're paying you to do something and you better do the job for the family. Right. I mean, how crazy is that? Like, you know, fix it. Fix <laughs> yeah, it come fix it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, <work> <laughs> yeah, it's insane, but you know, that that's probably 
uh, 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 kind of the um, the smaller part of it. The, the, I mean, you're you're probably seeing a lot of recovery, a lot of good stuff coming out of your interventions and and the families and you know and, and all that. I'm I'm sure, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, you know, when a family, it's an honor. You know, mm-hmm. when a family hires me and brings me into their family, at mm-hmm. the most, you know, it's it, they're 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 in crisis, right? And to be able to lead them through, you know, the muck, right? Mm-hmm. You're on this island and like the families just don't know where to go. And the muck is, you know, the, the intervention and even early recovery where they're kind of still wading through that, mm-hmm. you know, but on the other side, you know, right over there is freedom and abundance. And, uh, and it's there for everybody, you know, yeah. nobody's unique and, and being able to get that. And it's it's even there for the families, even if the uh, the the addict or the person with the, doing an intervention on it doesn't take it, it's still there. They can still cross over and get to that that uh, abundance of, of of happiness and joy and all that. Correct? Yeah, with work, right? <laughs> with work, of course, <laughs> of course, you have to build a bridge to get there. So, um, and I like how Let you me said. Just give a shameless plug. Ed's yeah. wife Stacy does an amazing loved oh, one yeah. support group. That's on- right. Monday night, every night. And way before I got sober, my husband was invited, even though, I mean, Stacy got me into treatment, but um, even before that, my husband was going to her support group and and getting the some support and learning, you know, a lot of stuff. She has a lot of great guests and um, just a wonderful, wonderful extra support group. And you can find that meeting on our website. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a Monday night, um, eight, seven o'clock Eastern time. And just a great meeting. And and some of that stuff they talk about at that meeting. And if you want more of that, please get over to that meeting. Also, um, Amy, we're not going to go yet, but just how can people get in touch with you? Because if usually at the end of the show, everybody cuts off and are like, yeah, I'm not going to listen to that. But how can somebody get in touch with you, a website, anything like that? Yeah, um, they can go to <laughs> intervene now.co. Okay. I'm a .co. You know? <laughs> and I did not think that all the way through when I, when I bought that domain. Um, so yeah, intervenenow.co. Um, they can email me through there. They can call me through Perfect. there. Perfect. Good, good, good. I want to shift gears a little bit. I want to get personal with you if that's okay. If not, you can hang up and say, fuck you. I don't know. <laughs> Please don't do that. Fuck you by the, rest, <laughs> by the best of them. So, <laughs> but uh, you know, what got you into recovery? Well, can, give us a little bit of your journey um, where, where you, you know, how you got into recovery, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so when I was 18, my parents, you know, they put me in treatment and I was in, I can remember thinking, you know, I'm not an addict. <laughs> like I'm, I'm in here with, you know, these old women and, you know, there's no, I, I, I could not relate to anything. Um, so I was there for quite a while. And um, when I left, it was a pretty immediate relapse. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was out there for another 10 years. Well, 12 years. Mm-hmm. Um And, you know, I think that there's always some form of intervention that happens for us to get sober, right? Whether it be Bambi, I heard you say, Stacy, you know, help to get you into treatment, like your friend intervened in your life. I'm just, um, for me, it was, it was handcuffs, you know, Mm. Um, you know, for some it's the court system, for some it's their families who bring in an interventionist. Like there's always some form of intervention that happens Mm. for, I think, us to have that moment of clarity where it's like, oh shit, you know? Um, I got to do something. And so that's, that was my journey. (laughs) Um, (laughs) handcuffs and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm super grateful because, you know, I was able to go to a long-term program Mm. and, you know, at that point, like I had gone through, like I, there was no denying that alcohol had sufficiently whooped my ass. Mm. Um, Let let me ask this. How, how did your family play a role in your um your using and in your um your recovery your enabling and then your recovery you know, you know, supporting is that did they play any roles at all or uh, e- either way yeah so um you know i was i was pretty far out there um at the end of and for three years my family didn't know where i was mm. so it was you know that's how far out there i was yeah. and um you know Putting myself in my family's position today, what a horrible thing to have to live through. Do not know if your daughter is alive or dead. 
And so it's not that they had, they, they were enabling me at all. Okay. You know, they, um, I just disappeared on them. You know, I didn't want to be found. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I, I didn't, you know, at the very end, I could care less whether I lived or died, mm-hmm. you know, and thank God, you know, um, that that intervention happened in my um, because, you know, I, it, I was in treatment for a long time and I think I needed that time. I think everybody's different, but for me, I needed that time to sit down, right. Um, sit down and just be still and really start over from, you know, I, I don't think I could have dug the ditch any further. Um, <laughs> you were at the core of the earth, right? <laughs> I was there. <laughs> So, so when you came back to reality and you surfaced, did your family give you support after that or, or yeah, good? Okay. They, All right. they did. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's our always rela- good. I'm sorry. No good. Our relationship today is amazing. Wow. You know, and it's one of the gifts of recovery is to be able to be there for my family today. I mean, my parents are getting older and, you know, to know that they can depend on me today mm. and that our relationship is so much more than it ever was, even before I ever started drinking and using, like, it's a beautiful thing. It's one of those gifts. Yeah. yeah. Just being sober. Yeah. And the family, you know, the family coming around and, and supporting you, I'm sure it didn't. And the only reason I'm asking these questions is because I want, you know, you, we were talking about the intervention, the family, and it just doesn't come, you know, you, you just don't get thrown in a treatment and then the world's perfect again. You know, there's a buildup, you know, like you said, you were lost and they found you, but now all, after all the work, I'm sure it took between you and your family to, to get things together. It's, it's just a much better world, better life now. Yeah. So I think about what you read, Bambi, in that book, right? And it's, you know, we want immediate, right? Immediate mm-hmm. gratification. Yeah. That's yeah. that's the addict in us. Like, I want what I want. I want it now. And when I got into treatment, I remember thinking like, holy shit, I'm ready for step eight, nine. You know? <laughs> I want to make I want to make these amends and I want to make these relationships right now. And um, and I had somebody tell me because, you know, my, my parents trust was very shaky at that. I had hurt them a lot, you know, um, my mom was terrified. And so um, I love how the steps are laid out. Thank God I wasn't able to make amends when I wanted to make amends. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it took time, right? Mm-hmm. And one day at a time, and really allowing them to have their space and not trying to force this relationship on them that we all wanted, but we had to build it. Yeah. And, and it's funny. Cause I know I was the same way. want to make amends and all that, right? Like, you know, day two, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to make amends everybody. But that, I think they, let's go back to that. It's go back. It goes back to that instant gratification. That's instant gratification. I want everybody, everybody to be happy again. And, and to love you. Know, you. Uh, yeah, exactly. And make love believe- me again because I've been sober for five days. Yeah. <laughs> and make believe this never happened, right? I mean, that's, you know, that's the typical attic way. So, and here's the thing, you know, and, and don't take offense to this, Amy, but you're not unique. Neither am I, neither is Bambi. This story that Amy is saying, somebody's going to hear, you know, her story that she's, somebody's going to hear about it and they're going to identify it and say, oh my God, that's my family. Oh my God. You know, there's probably thousands of other Amy's, thousands of other Jersey Ed's, thousands of other Buckeye Bambi's out there that are going through the same thing, exactly the same thing, but you know, that same path. And and I, that, that brings us back to the question of the of the, the the week is that, you know, we trudge the road of happy destiny to be where we're at today because we weren't trudging back then. We were just barely keeping our heads above water because we weren't even on a road. To me, anyways, I was sinking quickly in a ship with, you know, with, with nothing, you know, no life prever- preservers or anything. I'm happy to be on a goddamn road now. I don't give a fuck if it's, a, if it's <laughs> shitty or not. I'm happy to be on a road today, you know, because now I can... I can work and I can contact people and I can move to that. I, I can get my roadmap to go see where I'm going and make sure that I get to the other side to that happy death, you know, destiny, you know, trudging it, but you know, getting there. So um, any, um, any thoughts or any recommendations, if anybody's wanting a intervention, uh, Amy, or, or anybody who's kind of thinking about it, or maybe some of the signs that you, you might need an intervention. <laughs> Um, I mean, the signs are there, right? (laughs) 
um, if their loved one, if they've had this conversation with their loved one and their loved one is completely resistant to treatment and, you know, nothing is changing, um, then I think it's, it's a good opportunity for the family to start looking at for something different. Um, and, you know, I'll say this. So I'm a part of this platform as well. It's called Intervention on Call, and it is immediate help for families. There's about eight of us from all over the United States um, on this platform, and it's on-demand affordable help for families. So a lot of families can't afford an intervention, and they were stuck out there, you know, left to defend for themselves against this beast of addiction. And uh, the founder, you know, Sam Davis, who started this platform about a year ago, you know, he really wanted to be able to all families to get the help and all families need direction. Mm. So he created this platform. And like I said, there's like eight of us on there, interventionists um, and families can book a session. They can read our bios. They can book a session with any of us. It's 150 bucks an hour. You know, wow. you go to five guys, you get five burgers. For 150 <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, they, they book, they book an hour session with me. I give them everything I got mm. in that hour. And sometimes families need two or three sessions, but Sometimes an intervention isn't a, a full blown intervention where, you know, they, I come in, isn't needed. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's where we can start. Um, so, and, and how can they get, what's, what's that website and how can they get hold of that? Uh, it's called intervention on call. Intervention on All right. And that'll be in the show notes to scroll yeah. down through this one. If you're li- listening or reading it or, or, or seeing it, um, Amy, what, um, what we're, we're going to, we're going to kind of wrap up here, but what, what would be the, some advice that you would give a family member or um, a loved one, I guess. And even if some, sometimes if interventions aren't done by families or done by friends or colleagues or whatever, but what, what advice would you give somebody, um, you know, about, about an intervention, when an inter- intervention should be done, you know, most of the time, the reason I'm saying is most of the time people call when there's a crisis and when the crisis drops down and there's nothing going on anymore, they're never to be found again. It's hard to, you know, hard to get them on the phone. They're, you know, they don't answer you back. And so what would you say? You got Bob on the phone. He's calling about, uh, you know, Sally, his wife, and I need to get an intervention. What would you say to them to, to kind of make them understand that this is an urgent thing. We can't do it next week. We can't do it three days, you know, three, three weeks from now. What, what's your advice on, on some of that, you know, how to get that person, the family and the person into treatment? Um, wow, that's a loaded question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so true. It happens all the time, you know? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, <laughs> when, when a family calls me, when, when the, when a family member calls me, you know, I like to get the first 15 minutes of just the store. Why are they calling now? Mm. You know, what's happening right now? And then the rest of the phone call is, is really spent on a plan, you know, that we can begin now who, who is going to be a part of this intervention. Um, and from that point forward, it's a matter of me, I, I contact everybody who's going to be involved in it and really make a decision on whether or not, you mm-hmm. know, they should be involved because okay. sometimes families like we need, you know, the list goes on. Right. And Uh, It's not necessarily the more, the better when it comes to an intervention. Um, It's the most impactful and the most Mm -hmm. meaningful, um, the better. So uh, I think the last part of your question was like, how do we get the loved one into treatment or something along the way? Well, once, you know, how do you like, um, instead of waiting three weeks, I mean, obviously if you're doing an intervention, you can't do it tomorrow, but keeping engaged, um, you know, don't fall off the radar because that happens, you know, like, okay, well, you know, let's talk and, you know, we got all this. And then next thing you know, a day later, they're not answering your calls. That's because, because most of the time that I've been, as long as I've been doing it, crisis died. They're, 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 everything's okay. You know, they're, they're not yeah. in, in that crisis moment anymore. You know, they found them or they're not ODing or they didn't really steal the money. Mom misplaced yeah. it. So yeah. So something, you know, something along those lines, just make shit up. That's all we do on the show anyway. Yeah. So, <laughs> so if the family <laughs> hires me for the intervention, right. Um, They're getting a contract sent to them. I mean, we are, yeah. we're moving forward once okay. that contract. Once the family is invested in this, 
So I don't see a lot of families pulling back before mm-hmm. the intervention day. Okay. I've not seen that. Now, what what can get a little um, tricky is, you know, in those cases where their loved one digs their heels in on intervention day and the families are, you know, the next day after that or the day after where the families can begin to kind of uh, lose momentum. Mm-hmm. Right. So, mm-hmm. you know, we, I really am there to keep that. That's when that happens. Okay. Okay. Well, I guess that financial investment would keep them engaged. I mean, if you're paying somebody money, you want the service. I get it. I I think that's a great way to keep people engaged because it does die down if there's, if there's nothing, if they don't have any skin in the game or if they're not, you know, invested in, in financially or whatever it is, you know, and, and uh, once that dies down, um, you know, what keeps you, what keeps you kind of, kind of, you know, kind of linked to it. So, but get, I'm sorry, you were going to say. No, I mean, you know, really keeping the families rallied, like just, you know, stay the course, Um, let them have the experience they need out there on their own, right, where Mm -hmm. they're going to feel the impact of of your boundaries and boundaries are never set to manipulate or try Mm -hmm. and, you know, manipulate the outcome of this. Boundaries are just healthy Mm -hmm. and needed when addiction is involved. Scary, Um, too. Boundaries are scary, too. Yeah. Yeah. Terrifying. Yeah. But, you know, I'll tell you this. I mean, I have I think the longest, at least for me, that has been where families have set these boundaries. Maybe we got a no. We didn't get a yes on intervention day. Um, The longest was three or four days before, you know, their loved one called me and said, all right, what do I need to do? Mm. Wow. Okay. so so that that's how that kind of goes when you hold the boundaries. Hopefully that that loved one will call up and say, I got to, you know, I just, you know, I'm, I'm, out, I'm out of, I'm out of options here and you're they my last option. Feel, yeah. they, they feel the impact, like yeah. that cushion is taken away. Right. Yeah, so yeah. they're able to feel, you know, the impact of like, holy shit, nobody yeah. one is responsible for me. Anymore. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. I had all these people want to be responsible for me. Now they're not. I'm not paying my phone bill. It's turned off. I don't have the car the keys to the car. I can't steal mom's money anymore. Um, you know, Amy, thank you so much. And I had the pleasure to work with you a couple of weeks ago and uh, you were just, it was just great working with you and, um, you know, just kind of uh, he- hearing how, you know, just watching your style and watching everything take place. And, and I got to tell you, you go above and beyond. All right. Um, you know, kind of, kind of what was, what was happening with, with one of our clients above and beyond. It was, I, I get off the phone a couple of times. I'm like, really, is she doing this? Like, this is what, like, this is what we need out there. Right. This is what we need. The caring part. Of it. And I'm not saying all interventionists are not that, but, but I, I, I get the pleasure to work with you as far as that goes. And thank you from the bottom of my heart for all the clients that you help out there, get into any treatment center. It doesn't matter where, whatever it is, or, or on the road that, you know, trudging the road to happy destiny. I appreciate it for, for everything you do out there. And I'm glad, uh, I'm glad the world has an Amy Jack in it now, you know, as far Absolutely. as going on with all this. So um, Bambi, any closing words for Amy or anything? Uh, anything no, you I'm ask? just, you know, on this founder's day, I am yeah. just feel so blessed to be sober right now. Yeah. And after this, you know, I, I think back to the times when I was that person saying no. Um, and man, life has mm. changed so much for the better. All I can say is if you're struggling, you know, get some help, reach out to us. You know, the promises come true and life mm. gets better. Yeah, absolutely. And if you want to get a hold of Amy um, and you can find out about her inter- intervention services, look below or call us up and we'll get you in touch with her right away. And um, just don't wait. Just that's what I was trying to say before. Don't wait till it's too late, because sometimes you think, oh, I'll wait another day or two. Guys, this is a disease that kills us. End of story. Don't Jails, fucking institutions wait. and yeah. deaths, right? That's, that's right. That's, what it that's right. Yeah. So you don't want to be that person. I should have made that call or whatever. Make that call. The worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to piss off the addict. That's the only thing that's going to happen. And you're doing something <laughs> right. If that happens, then we're actually, we're doing something right. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and Amy, I'm sure Amy pissed off a lot of addicts in there and it made them happy that once they got out of treatment. So Amy, thank you for everything you're doing. Um, get a hold of us through our email, through um, her phone number, all that information will be there. And, Ladies and and everybody out there, stay sober. This concludes this episode of Friends in Recovery, the Addiction Recovery Podcast. Follow us on Facebook for past shows and updates and enjoy free access to twice daily support meetings. Friends in Recovery, the Addiction Recovery Podcast.
He's available on Facebook, Podbean, iTunes, and YouTube 24 hours a day, 7 days a week.